Wow, man. Thank you for that introduction. I yeah. feel like everybody deserves an introduction like that at some point in their life. Well, they got to earn it. This is true. <laughs> this is true. Great Yours point. Is, yeah. Um, but, but I hear what you're saying. Eventually that, that introduction will be coming through me for anyone. <laughs> One day I'll have you on my show and I'll give you an intro like that. Awesome. Promise. Same word. Let's do word for word. Say Aaron's about to come on. <laughs> I'll just copy the transcript. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so dude, Aaron, I'm, I'm really thankful you're here, man. It means so much to me. Likewise, brother. This is going to be fun. Yeah. And we've been and, talking about doing this for a long time. I know, I know it just, there was a moment it just called to me and it's funny, you know, that feeling of, you remember when you were, I don't know if you had this, but when you're a kid and you would just say to your friends, like, let's start a band or let's write a movie. Oh but yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't as inspired. It was almost just like, we need to start a band, but it's not like I have a song coming through or, <laughs> right. you know, and just knowing you, I, I kind of had that as like, we should do this. And then there was a moment I was sitting on this couch where I was just like, I'm ready. And I just like, you know, it was, it was more guided and said, it's time. And, uh, you know, having you on felt like a calling versus a should do just because we're hanging out and, uh, you know, it knows what it's doing. So I kind of yeah. just followed it. Yeah. I just felt like the universe wanted this to happen. So it happened. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Yeah, man. And, you know, this is our, so this is our exploring oneness series. And, you know, for the people that don't know, one of the many things that Aaron does is he, he's a master at the knowledge that came through and the understanding of the book Law of One by Ra. Would that be a good way to say it? I don't know. Fantastic. Yeah. Awesome. And it's funny because whether when you, if you read a book like that, you don't, I find you don't have to get too caught in, you know, it's easy to read a book like that, get caught in things that you can't see as specific, like mm -hmm. the Orion group or these people here, this type, this alien breed or this thing. That's not the area that I necessarily study it as far as just how can I live a better life and how can I expand my soul? I'm always open to those things as helping me make sense out of it. But I want to offer the audience you know, don't get too caught in um, a specific thing in the book that doesn't necessarily make sense, but just take what your heart is, is getting from it. But it's amazing when I hear Aaron interpreting it, it actually made the book make so much more sense um, and, and made it so much more understandable, I think, to the average human. Like, you're, like, let's say you're just going through a problem in your life. You know, if you go right to the law of one, which is like, I am channeling raw, you know, to a group of people. You, and, and I'm going to tell you there's this, there's this. For some people getting into it, it might be too far of a leap. But there's a way that, Aaron, you've put out so many great videos about what it is that made it so manageable and understandable and exciting and really that it ties to you, that it's not just an exploring of what other people or what the other, you know, species are doing. It's just an expansive thing. So I'd love to ask you, like, you know, what caused you to, at the level you want to share? Because I know that question of how'd you get started in this is so every podcast, but <laughs> what, what caused you to follow this? What caused you to, um, read it so many times too and, and study it so much and interpret it and how has it changed your life and how do you apply it daily mm -hmm. yeah well thank you first of all for the kind words uh, i feel like sort of in the same way that a mathematics professor would uh, at some point you know you just start to see the universe through math and it's like you're just now engaging with math and whatever you do. That's kind of how the law of one came through for me was like, you know, I, I read it six, seven years ago or something like that. And, you know, it's that first kind of massive awakening that book makes you feel of like, Oh, this explains the nature of the universe in a way that it's like some part of me knew this, but to put words to it is just incredible. And then the second time through, it was like the first time I read it again, like a whole mm. new level of meaning dropped through and just slowly, but surely, like as my own spiritual evolution has progressed, I think 
I've started to experience the law of one in my daily life, in my own evolution, in a way that continually um, reaffirms that text and validates that text. And it makes me even more excited to drop into it. So I'll read it a fifth time, a sixth time. I think I'm on my ninth time through. And on my ninth time through this book, I kid you not, it's like I've never read it. Like my jaw is hanging open while I'm listening to this text that I almost know by, you know, by memory at this point. And it's like, the, there's always another level of truth. I think that, um, as we say, you see things as you are not as they are, right. You're seeing everything through the filter of your own self perception. So as you know yourself more, I think any, any text, whether it's channeled or not, uh, it just seems that channel texts carry this vibration more so that it's like a fractal of truth or something. And the more you know yourself, the deeper you go into that fractal and see deeper and deeper layers. As, as Ross says, you are a microcosm of the macrocosm. So like you are a miniature encapsulation of the whole universe. So it's like awareness breeds awareness in that sense. Wow. I love the concept of, and, I, and it's funny because I also talk about this in a different way. How do you interpret uh, or could you expand on I love this. Uh, you experience the universe as you are, right? Not it is, right? You're, <clears throat> yeah. Because that might be really interesting for people that are like, yeah, but he doesn't know my story or there's my mm-hmm. issue with mm-hmm. my mom right now or my brother or my friend or whatever. <laughs> like how, how are they experiencing that through themselves or how do you find that? Yeah, it's a great question. It's, it's one of the most complex questions, I think, in spiritual understanding to tackle this idea of projection, because what we, what we experience seems to be so real, and it is in, in one context, but it's like when our scientists look out at the, the galaxies with their telescopes, it's like they think they're seeing the universe as it is, and right. it's like they're just seeing the tiniest limited fragmented version of the universe through our very limited understanding of what it even is like scientists science doesn't even acknowledge the idea of a creator yet you know they just they just give validity to creation but like don't even factor in that there's a creator of the creation and it's like how could you possibly expect to understand it if you think there's no it's like oh there's this beautiful piece of art but there was never an artist and this piece of art has nothing to say about the nature of the artist. Like that'd be crazy, right? Like yeah. all that that painting is, is a manifestation of the artist's mind. Right. Like that's what we're looking inside of the creator's mind when we look out into the universe. So let's not pretend we know too much, right? Let's right. be open to mystery. And I think that's where, um, you know, the don't know mind of Zen Buddhism comes in of like, It's not that you can't use concepts to be like, this is a glass of water. I drink water to hydrate my body. Like that's not wrong to say or something. But if I think I really know the nature of water, I'm an idiot. Right. And it's sort of like, that's kind of the nature of our world right now. It feels like, especially the more you awaken spiritually, right? Yeah. You realize like, man, even the most advanced scientists we have are like drooling imbeciles in the grand scheme of things. Like we know absolutely nothing about this universe we're inside of because we think we do, right? We think we've got it all figured out and it's such a huge limitation. So it's like, can I see how I'm doing that in my own mind, in my own world? I'm acting like that arrogant scientist who thinks he's got everything figured out. And the universe has to honor our free will. So if I believe I know myself, I know everything about my life circumstances, I don't need any help, I'm in control, the universe will just be like, no problem, you can have that experience. So that means I can't help you now. So like humility is such an important virtue in spirituality. In fact, as you know, David Hawkins said, it's the number one virtue for spiritual growth is humility. Because when you think you know, you just bind yourself. So it's like we think because we see the universe as we are, If I'm full of, you know, negatively polarized energy, uh, self-loathing, unworthiness, greediness, and whatnot, then I'll project those energies or, or filter my perception through those energies and see the universe like that. And I'll judge, oh, this universe is full of selfish, greedy people and all this stuff. And all along, it's like, that's a fragment of myself I'm seeing, but because I don't know that I am my only reference frame, 
Yeah. There's no other point of view that I can take to see the universe through other than me. Then everything I judge, everything I find an issue with is a part of myself I have an issue with, but I need a reflection to see it, right? If there was no universe outside of me, I would never have a clue what was inside right. of me. So as the Course in Miracles says, projection makes perception right. in that it's, it's all just here to give you greater reflections of your own quality of consciousness. It's so amazing. I love just playing with the topic of humility for a minute because it's so easy to have any type of success, you know, I'm not saying everyone can have that success easily. I'm just, I'm saying that when you have it, it's so easy to, hmm, it's so easy to have life feed you how great you're doing, right? Whether it's through rewards of people loving you, or, you know, if you just feel like you have the things that much, and then you're, you're put in this position often where you have to find humility and, and even say that these successes that you did weren't you. The painting wasn't you. It was something through you in that. And it's weird you say humility today and why I'm grabbing onto it this morning because that Mother's Day thing like opened something up in me big time. I, I just was thinking how like, you know, I come on this camera and I do this stuff and I don't know how much this resonates with you. I do this stuff. I have these teammates that are unbelievable. And, you know, two of them are these mothers and they're doing so much other stuff. And I'm the one that gets the spotlight and I'm the one that gets the, you know, whatever. And, you know, as I keep going, you go, wow, like, like we're, there's so much, it's almost like life is trying to get us to be in everyone else's shoes also you know, so like to really be in everyone's body and just be in a space of what everyone's experience is. And to do that, you can't have that much of a, I did that. That's all me. That's, that's because of me that you're so lucky. That's, it's impossible. And the second you do that, it, that, that does shut off the um, thing. And it's weird. You came on today because I just felt this, like you might, I don't know if you feel it, but I felt some I'm like, oh shit, something's breaking apart right before our call. Like I feel this like uh -huh. close to crying energy here. And, uh, you know, just the humility is inevitable for all of us because when we do think life is just about us, um, it comes crashing down really quick. Right. And it does. You're right. When you're in this humility, it just, you, you have to be in this kind of constant expansive, slightly unknown, at least unfamiliar, um, and move into that higher place. How do you yeah. stay in your humility? Like, and, and what is it that you follow and how do you identify mm. what is the story of Aaron versus the higher you or the, the humility mm. that's coming through you? Right. Does that question make sense? Yeah. I love it, man. Well, you know, I'm, I'm actually working on a video this week um, to post. This is one I filmed this morning that I told you about um, for my Law of One series to sort of like start seeing the enlightenment path in a very different way rather than me, the, the separate self or the, the small self trying to attain some great spiritual heights called enlightenment. Right. Rather than like that model, seeing enlightenment as the spiritual emergence of the higher self hmm. through the mind, body, spirit complex. So it's like in the same way that I dream at night, right? I have a dream that I'm some character having all kinds of adventures, but the real me is asleep on my bed. In that same way, like my higher self is dreaming me, this, this incarnation and what the law of one says about the higher self is that it's literally the future version of you late, the late sixth density version of you that is turning back in time and re-experiencing all of its previous incarnations or dreams, right? But not as the dream character, but as the dream architect. So it is designing the catalysts and the experiences it's going to bring you 
to help you grow and polarize and evolve. And so we could say that like the ultimate victory for the higher self in terms of like programming your life experiences in the dream is to program your life in such a way that you end up attaining this thing we call enlightenment, Mm -hmm. which really is just lucid dreaming for the higher self, right? So can we see it as actually I'm bringing my, the highest completed version of myself, which always exists, which I always am. Uh, I'm bringing that self through as it permeates through the limitations of this ego that I'm uh, struggling with. The ego is the voice, the belief in my head that says, I'm just this separate self. I need to fight to preserve and protect and enhance this separate self. And so again, one of the reasons I love the law of one is that it just gives you this incredibly expansive view of the universe that sort of just like annihilates smallness in your mind. So that now being an ego, trying to defend your, your sense of self, it's like, I don't want to play small ball with the ego anymore. Now that I know that the infinite cosmos are available to me, like I want that, right? So I think humility in a large part is sort of just comes by virtue of being aware of the nature of cosmic reality and the grandness and the magnitude of what we're inside of. You don't want to just be this person anymore. You want to be something so much larger so you can experience yourself in a larger way. So it's like, yeah, I love this expression of my higher self. It's a beautiful reflection. But in the same way, like even if I have an amazing dream, the dream's over and I move on, right? I don't try to stay identified with that dream character the rest of my life. That'd be super weird for sure. You're just hanging out with a floating Martin Luther King. You know, that's, that's my dreams. Nice. And, and Martin Luther King's floating in front of you and you're just grabbing it going, this is me. And yeah. you're just grabbing that dream, that one dream going, this is me. I'm the guy who hangs out with a floating Martin Luther King. And sometimes this is my best Rogan. dream. Yeah. <laughs> Joe Rogan's often here and he's also made of ice cream and this is my dream. And this is the truth of life. Yeah. It's a funny concept to picture grabbing a dream. And, and you can that. you can see why that would make you suffer too. Yes. Yeah, cuz it's trying to pass through. It's trying to it's just being moved through and you're grabbing it calling it you. Yep. Right? It's so, like aren't we all doing that though? Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. I'm just feeling it. <laughs> it's it's a very expansive view to take that kind of boggles the mind a little bit that all I, all I really am is the higher self. And in the same way that I have to evolve into that completed version of myself, step-by-step every single lifetime is a gradual unfoldment of that self. Then when we finally get to that late six density self, you know, every lifetime before that, it's like, it's like the same way that in this physical lifetime, you could say, I'm reviewing all of my dream lives, right? Every night I go to sleep, I have a review of a different dream life. Yes. And I used to practice lucid dreaming. Uh, when I was 23, 24, I was obsessed with it. And one of the practices is to, it's, it's amazing, the, the parallels. I would literally go to sleep repeating the mantra, um, I am awake, I am aware, I, uh, I know that I'm dreaming, I'm aware that I'm dreaming. It's like, you know, the Brahmins of India chanting, I am Brahman, I am Brahman. It's like, we're trying to wake up in this dream. We could say that like becoming lucid in a dream is like the enlightenment of the dream world. Right. Because what I would love to do when I would become lucid is, you know, levitate, read minds, create stuff with my thoughts, you know, all these supernatural powers happen once you awaken. And that's what we say, that's what we know happens to self-realized beings is all these natural power start manifesting because when you're awake in the dream, you're bringing the higher self version of you through in the same way that like the higher self version of the dream character is me sleeping in bed. That's my higher self from the dream. When I bring that self through and he becomes lucid. Now there's a greater degree of consciousness expression available. So it's like, can we see it? It's, It's all fractal, right? The same thing is happening in the universe, just in different degrees. So it's really exciting. It's like, wow, life is the greatest opportunity to experience and discover yourself. I don't want to waste it. Do you think suffering comes from the just 
being identified as the smaller self? Or do you also, you know, another thought that came in while you were just saying that was being aware you're the highest self, but living from the smaller self. I would imagine that would even bring in more suffering, right? Like being aware of this all that isness, but you've got patterns going that, you know, you feel enough external success or love or abundance that you can't let go of it. I, I don't know about you, but I would imagine that would be almost more suffering than not even knowing this exists at all and just being completely in that. That Does that make sense? You're absolutely right. That is actually the way that the universe has designed the evolution of consciousness, that there's a built-in self-propelling kind of mechanism to it in that the more awake you are, the less you can tolerate suffering. Right. right. The more expedient you have to be to escape suffering, the more awake you are, because it's just more and more unbearable to you, especially right. once you've experienced your true nature. Uh, sometimes people who haven't experienced their true nature just aren't even aware of how much they're suffering because it's like all they know. So there's almost right. no contrast to right. what's really available. So the grace for those of us who have experienced ourselves to any degree is that it makes it more and more impossible to re-enter the dream and, and fall asleep again. It's like being asleep is more painful now than it was before, yeah. which sucks for the time being, but it's absolutely a gift because the more desire you have for self-realization, the quicker it happens and suffering builds that desire, right? So yeah. one of the biggest blessings of my life was that two-week experience I had at 27 where I entered this two-week you know, enlightenment experience, and then slowly lost it after those two weeks. And the suffering was incredibly unbearable because I felt like I had this free sample of enlightenment given to me from heaven. And I screwed it up because I'm an idiot or something like the, the pearl of great price was just handed to me. And I just like, whoops, slipped, fell into a gutter and there, gone it went. So it was like this guilt, the shame of how could I have lost that perfect gift that heaven bestowed upon me? And that's of course, of course was the ego. But what it did for me was it blessed me with an undeniable confidence that enlightenment is absolutely available in this life for anyone who wants it. And so I just said, well, now that I've experienced that, why would I care about anything else? Modeling doesn't matter. Bodybuilding doesn't matter. Nothing matters to me anymore other than returning to my true nature again. And so I just, from that moment, had no choice but to devote my life to learning how to re-experience, re-attain that state in the same way that somebody who lives in, uh, you know, behind a dumpster and that's all they know, once they see the mansions that are available, it's like they literally don't have an option to go back to the dumpster. It's just the way it works, right? I went through the same thing. I, I, I just kept supermodeling for a long time. Like when I had my shift, I just stayed. I did Love you, supermodeling. <laughs> yeah. Just quite. Yeah. I did a lot of supermodeling. I was never a supermodel. I was just a regular model. Just regular model. I, yeah. I did super. I was mainly super. I, I don't know if you saw me. I have a crumb main. I was mainly super. Yeah. I super on the that. weekends. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now bodybuilding and, and Abercrombie and Fitch, like I was their main thing, but I just, yeah. when I fell apart, I had to still do it. And that's where my suffering came in. It was like, let <laughs> go of these packs. I have to force myself to have yeah. this six pack. Yeah. Ugh, what a drag. Let go of these packs was my, uh, my space slogan for three years. <laughs> that was your mantra. Yeah. It was so crazy. No, dude, this is so, this is so beautiful and so fun, man. Hey everyone. Thank you for watching today's video. I hope that you were truly blessed by it. And I wanted to let you know that I'm really excited to now be partnering with an amazing conscious supplement company called Organifi. A lot of you know that I'm also passionate about holistic health and nutrition and Organifi has been a staple in my daily health routine for a very long time. They make the most delicious, organic, and high quality superfood products that I've ever come across. And as you know, a healthy body is a great benefit for spiritual growth because the health of your body directly translates to the health of your mind. Everything is connected. So feeding your body with high vibrational superfoods straight from the earth is one of the best ways to create that environment 
for a healthy mind. But getting all the superfoods that your body needs in one day can admittedly be a little bit tough. And that is where Organifi can add a ton of value to your life. I personally start every day off with green, which is Organifi's really delicious blend of 11 superfoods like ashwagandha, chlorella, and moringa. And then in the middle of the day, I'll usually have a scoop of red, which is a delicious energy blend full of 13 adaptogens and antioxidants from berries to recharge your mind and body with a delicious blend of organic superfoods. Your body is an amazing organic machine, but it needs the right fuel and signals to function at its best. And red is full of adaptogens sourced from organic herbs and medicinal mushrooms. And these are compounds that balance hormones, prime your energy pathways, and alleviate stress. So instead of crushing your adrenal system with huge doses of caffeine every day, adaptogens work with your body and give you natural, sustained energy all throughout the day. What's most important to me though about Organifi is the way that they go above and beyond to ensure the cleanest and purest ingredients in all of their products. They are USDA certified organic, non-GMO, gluten-free, certified glyphosate free, and absolutely zero fillers. So I never go anywhere without Organifi and I never miss a day without taking it. And Organifi is offering a super generous discount of 20% off of your entire order when you use the coupon code ABKEY at checkout. So if you wanna upgrade your health regimen with Organifi, you can click on the link in the description box below to learn more about all the amazing products that they offer. And I promise you that your mind and your body are gonna thank you for it.